Well, hello everybody and welcome back to G-Bears Off-Grid Ways, a homestead in the desert. Today is the last day of March, the 31st. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, those uh, pain patches that I was mentioning in a prior video are supposed to be delivered today to my mailbox. And I'm waiting for the uh, notification that they're in. And I'm going to go pick those up and test them out because I have a sore toe. I stubbed it. That's uh, so one of the disadvantages of walking around barefoot uh, with shoes on when you stub your toe normally it doesn't hurt too bad but uh, yeah I'm gonna uh, try it on that toe and see how it works anyway I'll get back to you on that and let you know all right so today I promised that I would uh, show uh, how easy it is for me to readjust the angle of my panels here uh, at the different times of the year now you notice that I have these uh, cables going through and then they're hooked to turnbuckles on the bottom you know, that's to hold these things in place when the high winds come so that it doesn't jump all over the place because these things would be like a sail without it even though they're anchored well into the concrete they uh, they would probably uh, cause some damage here break things and things like that so anyway what I did when I designed these racks and uh, I did this with the uh, hat channel and uh, uh, electrical strut and uh, these um, end caps. They all came from uh, one of the big box stores. And uh, I uh, set this whole thing together um, using that. So I decided that I was gonna have to change the angles of these at different times of the year. So I planned ahead on that. And what I did was on the center strut there, I got my angle brackets that are bolted right through the main pole. Okay, so that's a pivot point at that area. Then I put another piece of strut on the front side there, and I drilled it and tapped it so that I could put that uh, brace in there with a bolt um, locked into place. And I put a nut on the inside, even though um, you don't really need it. I put it there just so in case there's vibration, um, it couldn't wiggle loose and come out of there. All right, so down on this end, I put another bolt and I drilled and tapped right into that uh, three inch pipe. And uh, you see three holes in my adjustment there. So I can adjust it to three different angles. Uh, and I've only been ha having to use two, the, the two on the ends, not the one in the middle. Um, so anyway, all I do is take out that one bolt and then I can grab this whole section right here by the panels and I just swivel it to get it to where I want it to be. These cables will slide right through that eye bolt and they don't have to change tension at all on those um, just because the panels changed. It's the same length of cable that's going to be needed. It's just that more of it will be on one side than on the other when I change the angles. That's, us, that's all there is to it. It's that simple. And I did them both the same way. But on that one, I was all out of 3-inch pipe except for that little piece at the bottom. So I inserted that into a piece of 4-inch I had laying around, welded it around the bottom, and then made my uh, new bracket there. And it, same thing, it's got two holes in it. So I just take the bolt out of there, uh, readjust it. It's got the same cables going through, uh, down into turnbuckles that are set into the concrete. It's a very simple method. I hope that explains it for you. And we're going to move on to some other things here. Okay, next, glue traps. This glue trap, you can see the fur in it down there. Um, every morning, there's another rat in there. And every morning, I clean the rat out and put them in the uh, um, coyote feeder. And it goes to the coyotes. And every morning, the rat is gone. Because it must be chewy with a little bit of that glue still stuck to it. But uh, I haven't seen any problems over there with uh, having it in place. So that's a, a nice thing. And uh, yeah, the, uh, every day, it's like seven of them already in that one trap. Well, that's the second trap. So about seven of them out of two traps. And I'm going to pick up some more of those next time I go over to the uh, El Rancho because uh, those things really work. 
I just wish they would work in the attic. And I'm starting to wonder what's going on up there because I hear the noises. I hear them trampling on the styrofoam ceiling panels. Yeah, it's unmistakable that they're right there on the panel. It's got that sound like a drum sound. And then uh, I can hear them jumping off of uh, rafters down onto the panel. It's a big thump. And then I can hear them walking with the, the little scratch, scratch. And, but there's no rat dropping, droppings. No rat droppings whatsoever. And there's nothing chewed up there. There's no chewed wires. And all of the different baits and foods and stuff I've put up there, they're still there exactly where I put them. Nothing has been touched. So whatever it is up there is not... Um, go, not I don't think it's even rats. Although I did get a picture of a rat uh, sitting by the um, event one time. And uh, I could see him as clear as day. But then again, what the heck? They, they don't touch any foods or, or baits or anything up there. They don't go near any of the traps. They don't go near any of the glue traps. Something's not right. Anyway, sooner or later, I'm going to find out what it is. Um, I could get off my huff and put one of my security cameras up there temporarily and see what I can catch on security camera. But uh, there's so many little corners and stuff up in the attic I don't know if one camera would do it. Although all I have to do is catch a glimpse of what's up there and then maybe I'll know what I need to do to uh, get them out of there. All right, the reason I'm heading over this way is because I got a couple of things I wanna show you. All right, first of all, let's see, where is it? I saw, oh, there it is. This plant right here if you don't recognize it, that is a pea plant, P-E-A. And they grow in all over the place out here. And you're wondering, well, do they grow wild in the desert? No. The reason they grow wild around, or they're growing around here in the desert is there's split peas in the feed that I give my chickens. And the little birds and the, and the ground squirrels were going in there and getting into the feed and hauling it away. Well, this was probably from birds. They carry it in their mouth and as they're flying, something um, <clears throat> catches their eye like a hawk or something like that. And they drop whatever they've got and they dive into some place to hide. And uh, the seeds tend to grow. And I've got these all over my property here. I'll show you another one in a little while. But uh, yeah, that one's even got a flower on the top of it, getting ready to set a pea pod. The point is, I said it before, I told uh, my neighbor up the road too, that uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, you buy a bag of beans or peas or anything like that, those are all seeds. So if you want to grow beans or, or something to... Um, replace the uh, beans that you normally eat just plant some of those that come out of your your normal bag that you buy those are all um, edible and they're all seeds so you can uh, grow them even split peas you get a bag of green split peas you can plant the green split peas and you will get plants like that to grow and of course there's not much water out here for them they don't get watered every day because of the, the heat starting. It's like 80 degrees out here right now. And I'm surprised I still have my shirt on because the sun hitting me on the back is uh, quite hot. Anyway, I just got a, uh, an alert on my phone that said that uh, there's gonna be another wind event up this way. So we'll see. All right, here's those dandelions I was talking about that uh, have been growing all over the place. And uh, earlier this morning, it was easier to see all of the little purple flowers that are around here, they're everywhere. And uh, I forget what the plant is called. The thing about them is they've got these little spikes on them right here. And uh, they, they won't hurt you. But if you have pets like dogs and stuff, they could get into the dog's ears and cause irritation. So you want to make sure that you check your dogs if they're out here in the uh, desert. All right, next, we're moving over to the pond area. You remember there was water in here. And somebody was mentioning I should line it with bentonite. And I replied to them, yes. 
Uh, bentonite is uh, pretty good for a uh, pond liner, and it grows. It's natural out here. Bentonite is basically clay. It's expansive clay, and it's everywhere out here. It comes down the streams when the water's flowing with the water. That's why the water looks brown and murky because it's got that clay mixed into it. And when it comes to a pond area, it'll all settle out into the bottoms of the ponds. And the lake beds out here in the desert, same thing. Well, that's just clay, and it will hold water as long as it stays moist. But when you get evaporation and it starts drying up on you, this is what happens. It all cracks. And you see how it all uh, peels up and cracks. It's separate from the sand. And that's what, once it's like that, it has to get all wet, all completely saturated again before it'll um, smooth itself out. And then you can coat it with some more and some more. But if it ever dries out and gets like this, you get cracks in here, it won't hold water very well. So the first waters that come down my stream in the next heavy storm is going to just sit, soak right through the ground. And until the ground below this is saturated enough so that the uh, water can start building up in the pond and melting all of this bentonite back into place, it's not going to hold water. So that's why I said um, this really needs a, a liner of sorts. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things you can do is you can take the, uh, the, the native soil here and mix it with plastic cement. And just like you were going to make a, make a mortar mix. But you're only going to add a much, as much water as you need to make it damp. You don't want it wet and slushy or like uh, mortar for setting bricks or anything. You want it just so it's moist. And then you can put it into place. And then you're going to use a tamp machine, a, a uh, uh, vibrating tamp machine, and vibrate it and comp compact it down solid. Now that will end up drying and giving a good base for the bentonite to sit on top of. And then it'll hold water a little bit better. Of course... That's only a, um, a chance thing, because if it all dries out again, you could end up with cracks. If you get an earthquake, you could end up with cracks. So it's, it's not a foolproof thing. Foolproof is they actually make liners that you could put underneath here, and you have to chemical bond them together. And that's what they use when they do uh, like water traps in uh, uh, golf courses, things like that, uh, man-made ponds. They use that liners on the bottom there to hold them together. So anyway, I wanted to cover that and give you a little bit of information on there. So that's all there is for today's video. I'm going to go inside, have a cold one. I got things uh, moved around. I was cleaning out my van today and putting stuff into the containers where it belongs and cleaning off my shelves so I can find stuff in there. So let's see what tomorrow brings. That's all there is today, everybody. G Bear reminding you, give me a thumbs up down there, please. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and share with your friends. Click on the share link down at the bottom there and you can share it through email or text message or any way you want to share it. You can share it. And remember, on my channel, all subscriptions are free. It won't cost you a penny. Just go ahead and click subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when there's uh, new videos. That's all there is to it today, everybody. G-Bear signing off.